Our second video from chapter eight is kind of a hodgepodge of information. And there's a lot of important stuff that's gonna be introduced in this video to lay the framework for the rest, of, the rest of the chapter regarding delocalized electrons. So I'll try and point that out um, as we go through it. The first thing we're looking at in this video is the stability of resonance contributors. And these ideas that are covered in the next you know, eight or so slides are really important. So make sure you understand the stability of resonance contributors, how to predict what's stable and what's not, and the relationship between number of resonance contributors and overall stability. And because all resonance contributors aren't created equally, right? They don't all contribute equally to the hybrid overall. If we look at a carboxylic acid, for example, right? This is how we traditionally draw a carboxylic acid. And this is the more stable resonance contributor. Okay, but we can shift a lone pair of electrons over in this pi bond up uh, to get another resonance contributor compound B over here. Okay. Now, keep in mind, right? Neither of these resonance contributors actually exists. Okay? What actually exists is the resonance hybrid somewhere in between the two. So because these things aren't real, we're just predicting them. But the degree of contribution to the resonance hybrid depends on the stability that we would assign to these things, okay? Now compound B here, because it has separated charges that are being pointed out, right, that's something that inherently makes a resonance contributor less stable. Here, where everything's neutral, that's more stable than something where I wind up with separate charges, something that's negatively charged in one place and something that's positively charged in another place, right? Especially with a positive charge on oxygen here because it's electronegative. That's unfavorable. And so I would recommend you keep a list of things that right, you wanna avoid in your resonance contributors. Does B contribute to the resonance hybrid? Sure. Is it as stable as A? No, because the first thing on your list would be separated charges. Okay. And this is just kind of putting into words what I've already said. The greater the stability of a contributor, the more it contributes to the hybrid. Okay? Therefore, the more similar the real molecule is to that contributor, okay? which is kind of common sense with what's being said already. Okay? So let's look at C and D here. Okay? For the carboxylate ion here, there's no difference between these two resonance contributors. Okay? In both places, I have just a single negative charge on two different oxygens. Right? All I've done is shift this lone pair over, that pi bond up. Right? These are completely equal to one another. So the resonance hybrid is 50% of both of these. But let's look at another example here. Okay? Now I've got a different, okay? because again, I've taken something looking at compound E and compound F. They're both resonance contributors, but E is more stable than F because first, right, we have separated charges. Again, that's the easiest thing to look out for. But in addition, even if we didn't have that, uh, something that has an incomplete octet, think all the way back to when you learned Lewis structures in general chemistry. That's the first thing you learned, right? The octet rule. So something with an incomplete octet versus everything over here having a complete octet is a less stable resonance contributor. So incomplete octet would be the next thing on the list. Yep. What else? I already alluded to this one before. Putting a positive charge on something that's electronegative, not ideal. Yep. So again, G is greater in stability than H yep. because again, H has separation of charge and it's put a positive charge on something that's electronegative. Again, keeping in mind, right, they're both contributors, but the one that's more stable is the major contributor, G in this case. So positive charge and electronegative, that's the third thing on the list. Let's look at this example here. Now this one is a little more nuanced because we don't have the separation of charge to look out for right away. So I look, right, I have a carbon ion in this situation. I move that lone pair of electrons over to form a pi bond kick this pi bond up, and that moves the negative charge over to oxygen. Okay. 
Now in this case, when oxygen has the negative charge in compound J, that's more stable because oxygen is more electronegative. So it's happier to bear that negative charge, which is a, a thing you want to kind of get in the habit of, keeping in mind that you can't move through things that are sp3 hybridized. Uh, if you can, you typically move electrons towards whatever in the molecule is most electronegative, unless again, sp3 is getting in the way and the only possibility is moving them away. Yeah, so to quickly summarize this, I have features that decrease predicted stability. Separated charges, that's the biggest one. Positive charge on something electronegative, right? Negative charge on anything but the most electronegative or anything with an incomplete octet. So you should definitely know from this video how to compare stability of resonance contributors. This is significant because that plays into something that's known as delocalization energy. Right, delocalization energy is the extra stability that something gets as a result of having delocalized electrons. And so to say that differently, if something has delocalized electrons, it is more stable. And the more resonance contributors something has, uh, the more stable it tends to be. Now you think about it as more things bearing the burden of those electrons. Uh, it's synonymous with resonance energy. And the resonance hybrid is more stable than any of the individual resonance contributors because it's a combination of all of them. Right? So that stability depends on both the number of resonance contributors and the predicted stability. The higher the number of resonance contributors, the more stable something is. And if they have the same number of resonance contributors, whatever has more stable resonance contributors will be the more stable compound overall. So looking, for example, here, carboxylic acid and carboxylate, we already looked at these individually. Both of them have two resonance contributors. Okay? So the number is the same. However, carboxylate over here has two stable resonance contributors. We talked already about how this one is unstable for a carboxylic acid. So two versus two, the one that has two stable resonance contributors has a greater delocalization energy for the carboxylate ion versus the carboxylic acid. Okay, so this has more delocalization energy, more stable. Uh, what about for our compound we looked at here? Right? Stable here with the diene, right? relatively unstable on each side, right? Three total resonance contributors. Notice the difference in the positive charge. So the number one and number three here are, are in fact different contributors but they're both unstable due to the separation of charge. So that doesn't have a whole lot of delocalization energy because right? it only has one relatively stable resonance contributor, right? Versus carbonate here, CO3 two minus, three relatively stable resonance contributors. Okay? So that's something that has notable delocalization energy as does, as we've already talked about, benzene. Okay? Significant delocalization energy, two equivalent resonance contributors. So that we see the stability is just as important as the number. Okay. So in summary, right, the greater the predicted stability of a resonance contributor, the more it contributes to the resonance hybrid. Right? The hybrid's gonna look more like the most stable resonance contributor. The greater the number of stable resonance contributors, the greater the delocalization energy. And the more equivalent those contributors are in energy, right, the greater the delocalization energy. So let's take that now and parlay it to look at the extra stability that a molecule gets from having delocalized electrons. We're gonna talk about isolated and conjugated dienes. Remember dienes from chapter five, I think they were first introduced, okay? It's two alkenes, it's a diene. Now we're gonna get more specific. Okay? Diene hydrocarbon with two double bonds. Isolated dienes have isolated double bonds mean they're separated by more than one sigma bond. Okay. So this is an isolated diene, they're separated by two sigma bonds. Here, conjugated diene, they're separated by exactly one single bond, okay. exactly one, not zero, not two, not three, right there. It's double bond, single bond, double bond. That's the pattern you look for to identify a conjugated diene, double bond, single bond, double bond. 
So let's see the difference in these, okay? We're calling heat of hydrogenation from chapter five, right? A lower heat of hydrogenation means something was more stable to begin with. And that tells me with two isomers of pentadiene that the conjugated diene, okay, with the lower heat of hydrogenation is more stable than the isolated diene. So now the question is, why? Why is a conjugated diene more stable? Well, right, if we think about the resonance contributors in this case, we have a resonance hybrid and we have delocalized electrons throughout three bonds. Uh, there are four carbons sharing those delocalized electrons versus with an isolated, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Never mind, the slide doesn't exist. Uh, but if you draw it out for right, an isolated diene over here, you can't draw any other resonance contributors. Right? So one four pentadiene, which is an isolated diene, only has one molecule. One three pentadiene has three resonance contributors. Therefore, it has delocalized electrons, has the corresponding delocalization energy, and is more stable overall. Hopefully that makes sense. That's all from slide 36. I just kept talking on slide 37. And okay, what slide 37 is telling us here is that right, the single bond that's formed from the overlap of two sp2 orbitals is stronger than the bond formed by an sp3 and an sp2 orbital. That's because sp2 right, has more s character. So those electrons are closer to the nucleus, meaning it's shorter and stronger. Okay. That makes us more stable overall. So that's two factors that are contributing to conjugated dienes being more stable, which is summarized in this table right here. Right. Notice sp2, sp2, shorter, stronger bond than sp2, sp3. So that's the next important point from this video. Know that a conjugated diene is more stable than an isolated diene and how to identify it. Also know the definition of an alene, which is a special type of molecule right, with two adjacent double bonds. Okay? So remember, double bond, single bond, double bond. That's a conjugated diene. An alene right, has two adjacent double bonds like that. So that there's a carbon in the middle that's involved in both of them. Yeah. And that's something that's unusual. You don't see these a lot due to the sp hybridized carbon in the middle right, and the way that those p orbitals have to overlap perpendicular to one another. Okay. But they do exist. Just be aware of the definition of an alene. Okay. And conjugated dienes are used in organic compounds that can conduct electricity. Okay. If you remove an electron in here, these guys can conduct electricity. Polymers that are used in LED displays, also used in airplane coatings right, to dispel electricity if they're struck by lightning. So that's the other thing, right? No isolated diene, conjugated diene, alene. And we finish by talking about allylic and benzylic cations. And I want you to know these definitions as well. Okay, just like we had vinyl before. Yeah, vinyl was directly, a, right? This is a vinyl carbon directly taking place in that double bond. Allyl is one sigma bond away. We've had these before. They're introduced again in chapter eight, right, in allyl cation. What's new here in chapter eight is the benzyl cation. Okay? The benzylic carbon is adjacent to the sp2 carbon of a benzene ring, whereas the allylic carbon is adjacent to the sp2 carbon of an alkene. The benzylic cation is adjacent to benzene specifically. Uh, both of these have delocalization energy and delocalized stability because they have resonance contributors. And what would be really good practice for you is to pause the video right now, take both of these and try and draw their resonance contributors. And there are two for the allyl cation and five for the benzyl cation. So let's take a look at those. A lilic cation, two resonance contributors of equal stability. So that means this is a pretty stable carbo cation. How about the benzylic cation? Look at that. Starting with it in the benzyl position, 
you can move pi bonds and bring that positive charge all around the ring. And notice that this first or this last one is different from the first one because the pi bonds are in different places. So there are five total resonance contributors to a benzylic cation. And that delocalization makes these cations more stable than the other carbocations. Right? A benzyl cation approximately equal in stability to something that's allyl and tertiary. Uh, and of course, that's greater than secondary, primary, methyl, and vinyl. This bottom part we already knew from previous chapters. And of course, not all allylic and benzylic cations are created equal. Just like before, the more substituted they are, the more stable they are due to hyperconjugation. Yep. So among allyl cations, that's right, something that's unsubstituted is the least stable versus something that's secondary versus tertiary. Okay. Tertiary benzylic, greater than secondary benzylic, greater than just a plain old benzyl cation. So if you're asking yourself, what's the most stable carbocation I have in this semester of organic chemistry one? It's this one right here, a tertiary benzylic carbocation. So that's where we finish this second video. Make sure you have that in your notes as well, the stability of all these different ions and be able, sorry, the stability of these carbocations and be able to draw the resonance contributors for benzylic and allylic cations. In the third video, we'll talk about this stability as it relates to molecular orbital theory. Okay. So a hodgepodge, as I mentioned at the beginning of information from this second video from chapter eight, but a lot of it's important. So if you missed anything, make sure you go back and get down all the notes because we continue to build on this information.